Hi, everyone. Um, today, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Sriram Narasimhan, whose internship at Archbold uh, began in April 2021. Sriram uh, comes to us from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, prior to his time at Archbold, Sriram worked uh, for the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation in their native plant conservation programs. And in 2019, he completed an NSF funded undergraduate research project using camera traps to study the relationship between the vertebrate community and forest structure at the Andrews Forest in the Cascade region, the Cascade Range uh, of Oregon. From Archbold, Sram will head back to Stanford University where he'll continue to pursue his degree in ecology. But first, we're all looking forward to his presentation on uh, his work examining the occurrence of feral swine in relationship to oak hammocks at Archbold's Buck Island Ranch. Um, I also will say Sriram's uh, internship has been generously supported uh, and co-advised by our colleague and affiliated researcher, Dr. Raoul Bott. Um, thanks everyone for coming today and I uh, uh, hope you'll stick around afterwards for some Q&A. Uh, Sriram, the floor is yours. Thanks, Joe. All right. Thank you, Joe, for that introduction. Uh, as Joe said, my name is Shiram Nadasamhan, and I'm uh, part of the Predator Prey Lab here at Archibald Biological Station. And today we're going to be talking about ham and hams on camp, a habitat use analysis of wild pigs using camera trap data. So a little bit about the problem. So feral swine or Suscrofa have been in Florida since their arrival with the Spanish in 1539 as a livestock species. So on the one hand, they're a very important livestock and game species, but on the other hand, pigs are an extremely invasive species. And when they forage for food, they often root with their snouts and tusks to get at tubers and invertebrates. This causes severe damage to native plant and animal communities. The USDA actually estimates that hogs cost over $1.5 billion in damages every year to agricultural land, natural resources and private property. Other than rooting, they carry many diseases dangerous to us and to livestock. The worst part is they're spreading. So as I said before, pigs have been in the South since the 1600s, but their numbers have exploded in the 80s. And as you can see here, they've also started to invade northward and westward into places like um, further into Texas and even up to Canada. This is a large part due to people moving them as a game species. This is all to say that the habits of wild hogs is critical to know for conservation, business and management interests in the United States and in Florida in particular, where they've been so long. So what do we know about them? We know that from diet data from Buck Island Ranch collected by Anderson et al in 2018, that over 90% of pigs sampled had eaten oak or phagaceae, as you can see in the leftmost part, leftmost part of this graph. We also know from Maillard and Fournier that in more seasonal habitats, the synchrony of birds and wild pig populations is highly dependent on uh, acorn mass that year. As you can see in this graph, precocity or the amount of pigs born before the median birthday increases sharply as mass production increases. Finally, we know from resource use surveys done by Wilbur et al in 2020 that natural resource availability shown here by Enhanced Vegetation Index or EVI has a big correlation with how pigs use commercial crops. If you look at the right side of this graph, you can see when there's a high availability of crops for these pigs, when there's also a high Enhanced Vegetation Index or natural resource availability, the visitation rate to these crops decreases. So what does this all mean? It means that pigs love acorns. Even in agricultural environments, it may be a very important part of their behavior and reproduction. And here's what I wanna know. Do we see pigs preferring these oak hammocks where acorns are? And secondly, the, their preference change with the seasons? We can form a hypothesis from that first question that I expect to see more pigs in areas with more oaks. From the second question, I can form a hypothesis that I expect to see an increase in the proportion of pigs in areas with oaks during mast season. What better place to study invasive hogs than in Florida on a cattle ranch? I did most of my research at Buck Island Ranch, a 10,000 acre working cattle ranch here in South Central Florida uh, with 3,000 head of cattle. 
It is a conglomeration of palm oak hammocks, wetland and pasture, as you can see in this beautiful photo taken by Joe Guthrie. And it is a subtropical climate with a wet summer and a dry winter. To give you an idea of the habitats on the ranch, I took a video the other day while we were doing And you can see here in this video of a pasture, it's a very open habitat, uh, very flat, except for the bumps created by native bunch grasses and non-native bahia grass. But on the whole, it's a very open landscape. We can contrast that with this oak hammock. This oak hammock is shaded very well by these beautiful Quercus virginiana or Southern live oak trees. And as you can see, the ground cover is a lot more sparse. One moment. To give you the complexity, to give you an idea of the complexity of this landscape, here's a couple maps I made in QGIS using Google satellite data. Here's all the ditches on the ranch that drain the ranch. Um, in the middle here, you can see Harney Pond, which clearly divides the ranch into a north and south part. Here's a map of all the wetlands on the ranch. These were delineated using uh, vegetation data gathered from field surveys in 2004. And here's our hammock data. Here's all the hammocks on the ranch and a zoomed out view since many of them lie on the border. These hammocks were delineated by radar, or sorry, LIDAR, excuse me. Now that we have an idea of where I did my field work, let's talk a little bit about how I collected my data. As I said before, this is a camera trap study. So I used 44 camera traps that have been out since October of 2015 as a part of a USDA funded study on how pigs use the environment in um, agricultural environments. These are automatically triggered infrared cameras that take 10 pictures in what's called a sequence with at least five minutes in between sequences. Every month, me and my team would go out and clear the areas in front of these cameras and collect the pictures on them. In addition to my camera data, I also used GPS data from a home range study done from 2015 to 2018 that tracked 71 pigs. And every 30 minutes, their location was recorded and beamed up through satellite. This ended up being a massive data set, uh, about 535,000 locations total. And to give you an idea of that, what you're looking at right here on the right side of the screen is only 1% of what I had to work with. Oh, sorry about that. Now that I have my data, the ne next step to answer my question was to classify the habitat each photo was taken in. To say whether or not a camera or a pig seen on that camera are in a hammock or a ditch or a wetland or what have you, we have to think like a pig. That's where the GPS data comes in. We can use the median straight line distance traveled by pigs in one hour, which happens to be 38 meters, to determine an available resource area around each camera, shown here by the circle. You can think of this as everything within that circle is more or less uh, less than an hour travel for a pig from the camera. We can then re overlay our habitat maps and we end up with something like this. So this camera in particular has 29% of its available resource area covered by hammock. So it's hammock score percent hammock. It can be thought of as 29%. We can do a similar thing for wetlands. This one has a 25%, 25.8% covered by wetland. And the only difference for ditches is since they are linear features, I decided to assign ditch scores as just the length of ditches within that available resource area. So now that I have all my data, here's how I organized it. For every hour and every day in the data set, I asked the question, is there a pig sequence on this particular camera? I'll explain that a little bit more in uh, the next slide. I then split this data based off of Quercus virginiana phenology collected by Andrew L. and Dade County in 1995. What that means is that if you look at this um, little graphic, you can see that in October, November, and December, they're covered by this dark circle, which represents acorn, um, the seasonal acorn mast. I assigned that to be fall and the season after that to be winter. I assigned their uh, fruiting times, which happened to be March, April, May, to be um, spring, and then the months in between to be summer. I then did a linear regression and a chi-squared analysis on the counts of pigs by camera by season. All right, so let's take a little bit to discuss my raw data. So this is what my raw data looks like. On the top, you can see the um, every hour of every day in the data set. And on the left, by rows, you can see the cameras. 
So if I could draw your attention to the 11th hour of the 11th day of January of 2019, on the 10th camera, on camera number 10, excuse me, we can see that we have a one, which means that we saw a pig during that hour. Take a look at that sequence. We can see we did indeed see a pig on the 11th hour of the um, January of 2018. I want to draw your attention to the fact that my ones and zeros, my occupancy matrix, does not account for the actual number of pigs. Sorry, my observation matrix does not account for the number of pigs or even the number of pictures of pigs. It's just the binary question on whether or not I've seen a pig on that camera in that given hour. All right, now that we got our data, let's look at some results. This is a lot to look at, so let's break it down. So what you're looking at are pairwise correlations for camera level variables, strong red being um, a negative correlation and strong blue being a positive correlation. So um, the columns here would represent the percent hammock or hammock score for each camera, the ditch length for each camera, the percent wetland in each for each camera, and everything from there, such as 2015 fall, would be the visits per camera for all 44 cameras during that season, similarly for winter and spring and so on and so forth. Taking a look at just the right side of this graph or chart, we see that everything is a blue representing a positive correlation. What this means is that our visitation or pattern of visitations in each season matches pretty closely to our other seasons. This is just a check um, to see that our data is consistent with itself. That matrix of ones and zeros, the occupancy matrix is consistent with itself. On the other hand, the left side of this graph doesn't show very strong colors at all, except on the diagonal. This means that the correlation between my habitat variables, uh, percent hammock in that available use area, ditch length and percent wetland does not correlate very well to the number of visitations. This was replicated when I tested generalized linear models for all these variables in each year and all the combinations of variables in each year. None were very significant in a majority of the seasons. Interestingly though, if I can draw your attention to the right side of this plot, we can see that percent wetland seems to be consistently negatively correlated with um, visitations in each season, if not, um, if not strongly so. This means that in quite a few seasons, the higher the percent of wetland in a camera's available use area, the fewer instances of pigs we saw. To answer my second question, I had to break my data up by season and also break the cameras up by how many cameras are in there or how many hammocks are in their available use area. So I broke the cameras up into three groups. One group had no hammocks within that available resource area. Some had, the next group had some hammocks in that available resource use area. And some had lots of hammocks, over 56% in that available resource use area. I then performed a chi-squared for every single year and all turned out to be significant. What you're looking at here are the residuals of that chi-squared. What that means is the difference between the observed and the expected value. So if I can direct your attention to the top left of this plot, we can see that in spring of 2016, the group of cameras with no hammocks in their available resource use area saw many more pigs than we expect, so it is colored blue. The number in each cell, colored dark blue, the number in each cell does not represent the actual difference, but the standard item search is residual. What that means, you can think of it as how much each cell contributes to the overall significance of the chi-square. Looking at the pattern overall here, we see that the group of cameras with no hammocks around them seems to have a pattern almost flipped of the, the group with lots of hammocks around them, right? So we see many more pigs than we expect in the no hammock group in spring and summer, and many fewer than we expect in fall and winter, and vice versa for the group with lots of hammocks. That same pattern was replicated in the 2017-2018 season, but I'd like to direct your attention to the right side of this table to winter of 2018 that seems to be contributing the most to the significance of the chi-squared. We can see that there's a strong red in the lots of hammocks group in winter of 2018. Now, why is that? Well, it turns out this coincides with a removal event. So in the south of the ranch in winter of 2018, uh, many pigs were removed. Um, and it makes sense if you recall from our habitat map that since the south of the ranch had many of the hammocks that occur on the ranch and many of the cameras within hammocks that occur on the ranch, if pigs are removed from that area, we expect to see less pigs on cameras surrounded by hammocks. The legacy of that removal is seen here in spring of 2018, 
But in the 2018-2019 season, the overall pattern of the no hammock group and the lots of hammock group being flipped is becomes apparent again. And that can especially be seen comparing the, the second group, um, those cameras with hammocks, but less than 56%, and the third group, the cameras with more than 56% hammock in their available resource use area. So we go back to our hypotheses. Did we see more pigs in areas with more oaks? Well, not quite. I cannot deduce from my generalized linear models or from my correlations that the percent hammock had any effect on the um, visitation per season for these cameras. On the other hand, using my chi-squared, I think I saw an increase in the proportion of pigs in areas with more oaks during mast season. Right, so those are the strong blue colors in fall and winter for the group of cameras that had lots of hammocks around them. Interestingly, I think that this also shows resource use and not the pigs using the hammocks for shade or uh, farrowing or anything like that because in those very hot um, months in spring and summer, we actually see less pigs than we expect in those high hammock cameras. <clears throat> In the future, I'd really like to investigate this uh, relationship further. Is it dependent on how many pigs are in an area or how many hammocks are in the area? I would also like to investigate the interesting wetland visitation correlation that I saw because many other studies have found that pigs actually love wetlands. So it's interesting that the cameras with many wetlands around them seem to have fewer pigs than we expected. I'd also like to replicate Maillard and Fournier's study and see how mass rep, uh, affects pig reproduction in Florida. And finally, I'd really like to know what these pigs are doing in the hammocks. Right now, we just have um, whether they're there or not, but I'm not sure what they're doing, where, how they're traveling in the hammocks, how much time they're spending, and what they're eating. If you'd like to look at my data further, here's a link to an interactive map of the observations by camera for every season. Um, and finally, thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Boten and Joe Guthrie for being so helpful during my research. Thank you to the USDA for funding my study and a big shout out to the Predator Prey team for being really supportive. And thank you to the entire station, all the station interns for letting me have the best summer I've ever had in my life. Thanks. Um, I guess we'll do questions now, Joe. Yes. Um... <clears throat> We can, thank you, thank you, Saram, nice job. And um, I would love to open the floor to questions. We don't have any, um, any questions in the Q&A uh, right now. So I imagine everyone is just working them up. Um, let's see, um, put the link oh. in chat for the map. This is one of the comments here. Give me one second. I have a question, Sram, about your um, the 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 threshold levels for um, delineating the size or the proportion of uh, hammocks in your resource areas for for around every camera. Mm -hmm. How did you decide that fifty six percent cutoff? That's a really good question. So. One, I decided to cut out the cameras with no hammocks at all, because I felt that since I didn't know enough about pig behavior, I, uh, I couldn't say that um, what level of how many trees would be important to pigs, right? But I could definitely delineate between there are oak trees in nearby this hammock and there aren't, right? And the 56% cutoff came from a natural cutoff I saw in the data. So if you see the distribution of the hammock scores for all of the, um, excuse me, all of the, the cameras, there is uh, clearly two groups with a, a cut right of 56%. So there was eight cameras with um, between zero and 56%. And then there was a gap of about 8% uh, or eight points in my hammock score. And then there was the next group. So I just decided to follow the natural, the natural cuts there. Thanks. So that's a good question. I see. Um, thank you. I'll um, I'll just read off a couple of questions we're getting now in the in the Q and A. Um, so, uh, Dr. Bowden asked, 
what was the highest number of hours in a season with pigs? The highest number of hours in a season with pigs, I believe, was around 430. Uh, I'd have to consult my, my, my map for that, but I think it was around 430. Um, I could check the map uh, later, um, but I believe it was on camera, um, uh, camera five. I'm not sure, but it, it's around, it was over 300. It was a lot of hours with a lot of pigs. Gotcha. Okay, next question. Grace is, comes from Grace. Um, she's asking if this type of study uh, might influence the location of any future removal events. Um, and, you know, if you could pick an area where we might prioritize a removal event, um, where might you, at the ranch, where might you recommend? That's actually a really good question. Thanks, Grace. Um, one of the, the reasons I wanted to do this study was because trapping hogs has been found to be the most effective way to remove them or one of the most effective ways to remove them. And to trap them, you have to know where they are. So if I was to like design a, a trapping project on the ranch in particular, I would again, trap them on the, the south side of the ranch where all the hammocks are. And particularly I would do it in the fall and winter time. Great, thanks. Um, okay, next question from, from Dr. Swain um, asks whether um, any of the camera data um, might be tied to the habitat preferences um, from any of the, the collar data that, uh, were, that you use to derive your kind of hourly movement rate. Um, wonder if you can comment there. Hmm. I understand your your question correctly. You're asking how does the the GPS data that I gathered relate to this habitat use? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. In many other studies uh, with other animals, people use GPS data primarily to determine habitat use. Um, I just wanted to use the camera data because it was available to me, and because I think it's an interesting. Uh, use of camera traps to find out uh, habitat use data of animals and it's not traditional and I think that it I think I'm not sure because I haven't done it but I think it would find a similar result that the pigs uh, there's more locations of pigs within the hammock areas um, and I think just anecdotally looking at that map um, excuse me looking at uh, my GPS map and zooming in I would often see clusters of points within uh, high hammock areas. So I think it would coincide. Yeah, but the focus of your project didn't, yeah, didn't include the GPS data. No, it was mainly focused on our, our camera trap data. Okay. Okay, um, I don't see any, uh, any new questions coming in. Um, we do have a couple from Facebook, Joe. I'll, I'll read them from Facebook since I can't paste them in. Great. Dawn said, sorry, came on late. When was the last mast year? That's a really good question. So I did try to find mast data for Quercus virginiana in Florida um, because as some people know, so oak trees in particular uh, often have years where they produce many fewer acorns um, compared to other years they produce a bunch of acorns. Unfortunately, I couldn't find um, that data for our part of Florida, so I didn't include it. And I just defined mast as um, the season in which most um, the most acorns are dropped, uh, that being October, November, and December. So to pursue it to your... your um question there about where to look. Um, Dr. Swain has a recommendation uh, in the in the chat about, um, you know, a paper from uh, from our colleague Warren Abrahamson and, and Jim Lane uh, looking at long term patterns of acorn production for five oak species in in um, Florida uplands. Now that's that's not uh, that doesn't that doesn't really uh, relate to uh, Quercus Virginiana. Um, but one, one kind of lead there. 
Yeah, I thank you, Hillary. I actually looked at that same paper the other day, and it was it was very interesting. Um, I just wasn't sure if it would um, carry over, like Joe said, to the the live oaks on the ranch. But it's a really good paper. I recommend checking it out. We've got um, a, a late arriving question, uh, a comment from um, from Raul here. Um, he says, "Really great job, Saram. The original GPS data." Analyses actually show high preference of pigs for wetlands above all other habitats. Um, so his question is, um, can you think of why camera data may not reflect the same relationship? I actually did think about that because, thanks Raul. Um, I thought about that because uh, as I said, it seems that we find uh, uh, a slight negative correlation between the percent wetland and how many uh, instances or how many hours have pigs in them, which I thought was interesting from because uh, your study and others found the opposite. I think it was because the pigs like to root and forage on the edges of these wetlands and not um, within them. So I think maybe that's why my data didn't um, correlate or coincide with the the GPS data, but that is that is interesting. And like I said, I'd like to look at it further. That's just my guess is that um, they prefer the edges of these wetlands rather than the very, the center of them. Great, um, we've got uh, now another question from, um, uh, from Facebook, I believe um, from Brad. Uh, great presentation. Have you had a chance to look at the effect of other food sources on pig movements. Um, uh, this question um, includes, you know, observation that um, the uh, person sees, the Brad sees uh, hogs in big spurts. He gets a lot of pigs at once. Um, you know, it may happen kind of periodically and then may go, you know, and then he may go a couple of weeks or months without seeing any. Um, he has to think they are on other food sources. What do you think? I think that's a, that's a really good question. Thanks, Brad. Um, I'm not sure of other fruits, food sources other than, than acorns. Uh, we can see that pigs do have a very, a very, very diet. Um, they're eating all these different plant and animal species. Um, I'm not sure which other ones would be as seasonal as, as these oaks. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, uh, a lot of their diet is also grasses and in agricultural landscapes, I'm sure it depends a lot on when those crops are um, getting ready to be harvested and, and things like that. Okay, um, well, that, um, that is about all the questions we've got. Um, I think- one more, I, We did get one more in the yep. chat. Uh, yes, Steve T asks, how was the direction of each camera established um, and could that have influenced the wetlands results? Um, I'll say that the, the, these, these cameras um, were established in, um, in 2015, is that right? Um, at, what's your thought on, on whether or not the placement of cameras might have influenced the occurrence of pigs um, on them, I, I had a, had that thought when we were when you were answering the questions about um, comparing wetland the GPS data and their preference for wetlands. That is a good question. Um, from my experience, it does seem, and Joe, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, the cameras that are next to wetlands usually are on the edge of them facing in, right? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I don't know if that was a um, a definitive choice or or um, just by chance, but that's just what I've seen. Mm -hmm. Maybe that could affect the result uh, being that most of the, the cameras on the wetlands, like I said, are facing in and not out. Maybe they don't see the pigs coming in. They only see them walking through. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. That's a good question though. I'd like to look into the design of the direction these cameras were placed in. Okay. Um, 
Laura, can you help help me here? How do we? Uh, is this where we conclude, or uh, shall we uh, continue? Any other comments from the from the um, from the audience? I see a link to the Abrahamson and Lane paper in the chat. Go ahead. Sorry, Laura. No, nope, I was saying I think we've got all the questions answered, and that was wonderful. Great job, Saram. Thank you. Um. Yeah, so I'll just close if you're ready. Uh, thanks everybody for attending today and join us again next week at 3.30 on Thursday for an avian ecology double feature with Tori Bakley and Bryce Lushen. Thanks, Laura. Thanks everyone. Have a great weekend. Thanks for coming, y'all. I really appreciate it. All right. <laughs>